Hey, good afternoon, everyone in the in the room and online. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in Lipset for the NHGRI seminar series. Uh, and welcome any of you to come uh, in the future. So uh, I'm Julie Segre, and I'm here to introduce Christina Cuomo. It's a real pleasure to welcome Christina to the NIH. Christina is a long time colleague, although it has taken me a while to get close enough to be able uh, in fields to be able to work with Christina. So uh, as a bit of a background, Christina um, has her PhD in genetics from Harvard and um, then uh, did a, a postdoc at UCSF um, and then joined the Whitehead Institute and started to focus on the human genome and joined the human genome closure team. So uh, was part of closing chromosomes eight, 11, 15, 17. Remember when we used to do chromosomes one at a time? That was in 2005, 2006. But really at this same time, Christina was developing an independent research project, becoming a leader in fungal genomics. And in 2007, published one of the first fungal genomes for Fusarium graminarium. This is always my problem with microbiology. I can't pronounce any of these things, but really went on to sort of be the pioneer and be the leader in the genomic studies about fungi and sort of how would genomic information reveal really cool biology about, so for example, in 2009, a study on the evolution of the pathogenesis and the sexual reproduction in Canada genomes. Um, and also, uh, so while Christina's uh, research has focused mostly on human pathogens, she's taken also a larger view of human health and thought about environmental health and was one of the first people who talked to me about uh, the chytrid um, fungi that were um, affecting uh, frogs and um, is really just uh, very well versed in uh, the different fungal genomes and works with so many people and is seen as uh, really the person who is leading fungal genomic studies. So today, Christina's talk is going to focus on population genomics and the evolution of virulence traits in Cryptococcus neoformans. So welcome, Christina, and good to have you here. Thanks. Thank you, Julie, for that introduction. And thank you also to Diana Proctor for the invitation to come. I'm gonna to focus today just on one area of what we work on is um, talking about cryptococcus. And the um, priority that we've given to cryptococcus has been highlighted by this recent WHO report. Um, this, this came out just um, within the last few months where the WHO prioritized um, for the first time, this this um, the some of the most health threatening fungi, um, and they did this because of the on the increasing threat of fungal infections um, and the rise of antifungal resistance. And as piloted in these quotes, that they're because of that they're becoming resistant to the treatments that we have. And the top of the list of the most important threats, they highlighted this critical priority group. Um, that includes four species that we work on in my group, and one of these is Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus is a global disease causing meningitis, and it's been estimated to cause over 180,000 deaths per year. But it is of particular burden in sub-Saharan Africa um, because of the large population of HIV-positive individuals there. Um, and in that cryptococcus is causing disease in immunocompromised individuals. But because of that also, it affects people worldwide in the United States, causing disease in people who are immunocompromised or um, living with um, cancers or who are um, undergoing things like organ transplants. And this picture just highlights the um, annual incidence of cryptococcus around the world. Wanted to also highlight that um, 
you know, while I highlighted a lot of the, the, some of the other fungi that are human pathogens, including candida and aspergillus, that cryptococcus is very distantly related from them. Um, here in this phylogeny produced by Antonos Rokas in a paper last year, um, this is highlighting in red some of the fungal pathogens within the human, within the fungal kingdom. Um, Cryptococcus is in a, a phylum called Basidiomycota that contains um, a, a, a genus of, of fungi that are um, commensals and cause um, dandruff called malassezia. But otherwise, this is not where you find human fungal pathogens. You mostly find them um, more around four or five o'clock in this phylogeny where you find candida um, and then dimorphic fungi down around six o'clock. So it's not very closely genetically related to other human pathogens. So um, some of our knowledge is really going to be need to be newly discovered about what makes it a pathogen. And within Cryptococcus, there are multiple species. How many species has been a topic that has been pretty widely debated. And wanted to just recognize that there are these two large subdivisions called Cryptococcus gaddi and Cryptococcus neoformans. Um, I won't be talking about Cryptococcus gaddi, but just wanted to mention that this is really different in that it affects um, immunocompetent hosts um, and has been um, found within the United States, particularly causing an outbreak in the, the Pacific Northwest um, and has been subdivided into these lineages or species um, that are on the top of this tree. But the group I'll be talking about is Cryptococcus neoformans that I've mentioned affects immunocompromised hosts. It has environmental reservoirs in different types of trees, um, in urban environments, in pigeon guano, and also in soil. And as I noted, it has a global distribution. And I'll discuss how it um, has been broken down further into these distinct genetic subgroups, um, here denoted BN1, BNB, and VN2, that have distinct global distributions. And I'll mention further that there's a related um, species called Cryptococcus deneoformans, um, and then the, these two can be distinguished serologically. So while Cryptococcus is an um, environmental pathogen, it's been demonstrated that Isolates from the environment and isolates from the clinic uh, are very different in virulence. So first, just to review its mode of infection, as I've mentioned, there are these environmental reservoirs that um, from which spores can be released and infection then can start as um, being inhaled and begin as a pulmonary, um, inhaled into the lungs um, and begin as a pulmonary infection. It can then disseminate to the central nervous system and cause meningitis, um, and those infections can be diagnosed by a positive culture. And if you compare these clinical isolates that are recovered from patients from those recovered from environmental sources um, side by side in a mouse model um, in this paper from Anna Lipinseva, they're very different in how they affect the mice, where the environmental isolates as a group um, in this study did not cause the mice to die, but the clinical isolates did. So although this is an environmentally acquired um, pathogen, this suggests that um, there are isolates that are very predisposed to causing clinical infection, which seems unusual for an opportunistic pathogen, but perhaps there could be um, things in the environment that are predisposing it to cause um, disease, it's been hypothesized that this could include interactions with other eukaryotes, such as amoeba. Um, but we'd like to understand what, what are the factors that, that explains these kinds of differences. So to do this, um, we launched um, a large genomic study to understand how natural variation contributes to virulence. And we began this by trying to better understand the population structure of both clinical and environmental isolates and taking this global perspective. Um, 
We also looked at recombination and hybridization in these populations to lay the foundation for doing genome-wide association studies that then we um, tried to use to look at genetic traits associated with clinical isolates. And then we married the whole genome sequencing to phenotypic analysis that I'll describe. Um, that was either um, a range of things from in vitro phenotyping to using patient um, metadata to try and associate traits with the genome um, variants. So to start with the picture of the population and structure, we did this using phylogenetic analysis from the whole genome sequence. And this revealed that while initially there were described these three population subdivisions, our analysis showed very clear support for four major subdivisions. And that's shown in this phylogeny in that we recovered this new split at the top of the tree of the VNB group separating into two lineages. And that the colors around the external um, circle um, at the, the blue and the red at the innermost circle are showing clinical and environmental origin. And what I hope you can observe even at a distance is that, that there's a good interspersed um, pattern of these two colors. So there aren't any big pockets of being a clinical isolate or an environmental isolate. They're fairly interspersed. So this suggests that there's not any one or two or three major clinical lineages, but that um, these, these patterns are interspersed, suggesting again that a association approach seems like a valid way to proceed. Um, just to provide a little more context of the type of initial work we did, we did find some additional substructure within one of the lineages called VN1, where it split very cleanly into three separate clades um, that we gave additional um, names to. And we found that these were also um, separated by geography, where one of them that um, uh, we called VN1C, that is in the, the principal components analysis that is on the right part of the slide, was entirely composed of isolates from Botswana, which is in, were collected from, uh, all collected from the, the uh, southern, uh, represented the most southern part of Africa that we collected isolates from. So um, this, um, whereas in, in contrast, the other two um, groups in um, this tree were, and in the PCA were, were, were globally collected. So while VN1 is thought of as a global lineage, this shows that the, the finer scale picture is a little bit more refined where one of the groups is actually specific to Sub-Saharan Africa. So then to pivot now, once now that we have a, a clear understanding of the population structure into carrying out genotype-phenotype association, I wanted to just give a picture of what kind of data we were thinking about for some of the phenotypes. Um, we wanted to be able to test phenotypes that were going to be as relevant as possible for thinking about virulence traits. So for cryptococcus, two of the big ones were production of melanin, which is a, a virulence property, um, as well as these other ones that are, are listed here um, to do with temperature growth, resistance to oxidative stress, um, and drug, which I won't have time to talk about. Um, and then I will talk about as well some of the clinical metadata um, as I go through the talk. To carry out the genome association, because we saw such strong population division, we decided initially to separately analyze the lineages um, and, and um, carry out separate analyses for these like VN1 or VNB separately. And we um, then um, subset the variants for their functional impact, but we also, because we know that we are looking for probably rare variants to be able to um, look for things associated for virulence, we decided to collapse signals by gene to be able to find rare variants. Um, and then the test that we run was called GEMMA, which is a linear mixed model. 
So um, the first test that we ran was for loss of melanization, which is a, an assay that you can just run on a plate and measure for each isolate the level of melanin. And the top hit that we got from the GWAS was a loss of function mutation um, in a transcription factor called BZIP4. And we had four different mutations that were associated with this um, transcription factor in four different clinical isolates. Um, and then the, what they actually look like is shown on this plate, um, the three at the bottom, and then the one, the top row on the right is a little more melanized. And then there's some controls of a wild type isolate that is melanized and a mutant that is not. Um, and then this is just some reproducibility of the assay. This was a gene that in a transcription factor screen by another group was shown to affect melanization. So this was already validated, not by us. Um, so this was a nice kind of positive control that we were able to pull out a real signal. Um, and then we had the other hits that were coming out in this um, uh, analysis were all, many of them were in or next to um, a serine threonine phosphatase that um, we haven't looked into as much because they were very common variants. In this first analysis of um, GWAS, we also then took a, a very, um, I guess, aggressive swing at trying to look for variants associated with just being a clinical isolate. So asking, are there SNPs associated with clinical origin compared to environmental? And when we did that, we found that, yes, you can find SNPs and they are, if you look at the top of the list, what you see is a lot of genes that are linked to virulence factors um, and genes involved in the oxidative stress response. Um, but many of these mutations are um, either um, common or um, in uh, uh, genes, and some of them are um, kind of in, in just linked to the genes in, in intergenic regions. So nothing directly yet to follow up on, but we're, I think we took this as a positive sign that this analysis looked like it was going to be able to find some signal. But we definitely recognize that just comparing a clinical to an environmental isolate may not reflect the level of virulence. So what we wanted to move to next was to be able to look um, a little closer to reflect the level of a strain's virulence by moving to uh, metadata of the how um, the patients that the isolates came from um, fared um, during the course of their infection. And we did this by partnering with um, the clinicians who were involved in this clinical trial called ACTA. This was a trial of patients from hospitals in Malawi, and it was a trial for um, antifungal regimen. And the patients were all HIV positive and had developed meningitis, and the trial was comparing two different antifungal regimens. So we sequenced about 300 cryptococcus isolates. These now are from a different lineage than the previous um, analysis. These are mostly VN1. And with this clinical, with this uh, study, working with the clinicians, we selected um, this metadata that the clinicians thought might be um, useful for us to think about comparing, including the fungal burden, how fast the infection was cleared, and then things to do with the, the how the patient fared during the infection, the mortality, how long they survived, and things to do with their mental status reflecting the meningitis. Um, and again, one of our preliminary assessments was plotting some of these features on the phylogeny to ensure, to, to, to evaluate if there was any jackpotting, again, of phenotypes of, of genetically related isolates, which again, we did not observe, suggesting that um, there's no, again, kind of single genetic lineages representing strong phenotypes. So the other initial um, look we took at the metadata was just comparing it um, to uh, determine what had the strongest correlation um, just with itself. And 
In doing this, we found a very strong correlation between the fungal burden or the, the colony forming units coming from the CSF and the patient mortality. Um, and when we looked at the fungal burden in the CSF, um, there's a very wide range that was um, observed in, in the counts that came out. So this plot is showing for isolates from these different VN groups and a few from VNB, that there's a very wide um, dynamic range here plotted on a log scale of these CFU counts. So from this, we, we thought this was going to be a good place to start of a GWAS with the level of fungal burden because it was such a, it looked like it was a good measure of death and it had a wide dynamic range. So we ran the GWAS with the fungal burden and we were able to find that there was a, um, a, a very uh, strong association for variants with um, genes involved in virulence. And this provided some interesting hits, including um, that one of the, the top hits was a, a gene that is the target of azole drugs, ERG11. This included multiple genes involved in capsule, which is the um, polysaccharide coat that um, is on the outer part of cryptococcus and also considered a virulence factor. Um, there's a, a, a gene called SGF29 that I'll, I'll mention that I'll come back to that is um, involved in histone acetylation and um, also melanization and, and virulence and other genes involved in thermotolerance or iron. So this is a pretty encouraging list. You can see um, there, there are um, definitely kind of single hits that come up on this Manhattan plot which I'm showing here, just the, the 14 chromosomes of cryptococcus and the p-values of the individual SNPs. So in terms of follow-up, we selected the most highly significant loss of function mutation and working with John Perfect's lab at Duke, um, they tested this gene in a rabbit model. This was a loss of function mutine, mutation in a phosphofructokinase that is involved in glycolysis. Um, when this gene was deleted in the lab strain H99, uh, in a mouse model, it did not affect the survival of mice in an infection model. But when they deleted, when they tested this deletion in a rabbit model, that has some advantages for recapitulating what infection looks like in a human. Is it? Um, uh, significantly reduced the fungal load that you measure from CSF um, in the plot on the right. And that is the phenotype that we were associating on. So this was, was recapitulated. I also want to highlight importantly that while we find many interesting hits from the GWAS, a lot of the um, top hit, a lot of the top um, uh, genes that are are highlighted now with um, this version of the slide and noted with HPs um, in the the um, in the cloud above the within the red plots are hypothetical proteins and in fact as noted here nearly a third of the most highly significant variants are these genes with very little or no um, predicted functional annotation so. There's a lot of um, uh, a lot that we have yet let to learn about cryptococcus gene function. Kind of as I alluded to um, in the slide of phylogeny, cryptococcus is um, again just a lot of phylogenetic distance away from other known fungi that from which we can infer function. So to um, start to do that for one gene. Again, we took what was the most highly significant GWAS association, um, a frame shift in an unknown protein. Um, and we took two approaches. We looked at um, the difference in virulence of two natural isolates and tested them side by side in a mouse model on the left. And in that model, um, we were able to show that there was a significant difference in the survival of mice. Um, just under a, a significant p-value. 
However, when we go and delete this gene in the lab strain H99, we do not see a significant difference in, um, in the probability of the mice survival. So to us, this suggests that um, there might be other factors going on in these natural isolates that we have not yet uncovered um, that either might interplay with these genes um, or, or contribute to their virulence. We also are taking advantage of all these sequence genomes to look at what larger other forces may be at play um, and looking at selection across all of these lineages um, that I've mentioned. And when we do this using a, a test for selection um, across the entire genome, um, what we're able to highlight is genes that have undergone um, selective sweeps um, in each of the lineages. And one major signal that this has highlighted is the importance of um, sugar transporters, um, in, um, carbohydrate transporters, and um, inositol glucose um, transporters in particular um, in VN1 and VNB lineages. And here I'm just showing a more detailed phylogeny of those transporters where we've done a, a more detailed analysis of selection um, and highlighted in red the, the, the individual genes that are under selection in different lineages. So inositol and xylose um, are, are compounds that are abundant in plants, which might then explain why they've been selected is that they're important in the environment. But why it might be important for the pathogen is that inositol is really abundant in the human um, central nervous system. So that might be a real benefit for cryptococcus as a pathogen. And it's been shown that it's actually required both for virulence and mating in different studies. So this is helping to highlight how this you know, really strong selection in the environment um, probably is a, an example of coincidental adaptation for the human central nervous system. Um, lastly, we we are would really like to be able to, of course, be able to zero back to looking at how um, uh, the an isolate from the environment then moves into a human and adapts, but there. Um, it's extraordinarily rare. There's only been one case published of, of tracing the exact origin of um, a clinical um, case back to its an environmental source. For the other, you know, many, many, many cases, um, we we don't have that exact uh, mapping. Um, we also for um, the. The populations that we've looked at um, for VN1 have only had very few environmental isolates collected. But we have now gone back and tried to, for VNB, um, match um, geographically around these hospital locations where we've been sequencing large clinical um, sets of isolates go back and collect um, environmental isolates in the same location and see if we can come more close to um, matching isolates. Um, so that was done um, and, and in this, and then we um, repeated this study with um, um, the collecting was done by Daniel Luedo and um, Poppy Sefton Clark and my group then repeated the GWAS. And the um, hit that I wanted to talk about from this analysis was the gene I mentioned, one of the genes I mentioned earlier called SGF29 that is very strongly associated with clinical isolates when we do this test. Um, so this is in this now um, collection we have of, of 650 VNB isolates. And we see this mutation really exclusively um, coming up in clinical isolates that we see loss of function mutation occurring um, of this gene called SJF21. This is, as I've mentioned, is uh, involved in chromatin modification. Um, so might have a lot of pleiotropic effects, um, but looks very, very specific for um, these clinical isolates. Um, 
And what's interesting about it is that a recent paper has also described it occurring within this, this uh, interesting series of isolates that are um, linked to the lab strain called H99 as it's been passaged by different groups. And um, in one of those passages, um, moving on, on the right-hand side of the slide from this H99-0, um, as it's becoming hypervirulent, it has um, it had this this paper noted it, there was a loss of function and mutation of this gene that occurred. And so, as I've noted here, this gene is is um, involved in histone acetylation, um, and and so we expect that there might be a consequence of a lot of different epigenetic changes um, as a consequence of, so a bit complicated to look into, but definitely intriguing that um, this might be a common change that's occurring in clinical isolates. Um, one other common uh, mechanism we've uncovered that's occurring in clinical isolates um, is aneuploidy, which is very common and has been known about in cryptococcus. Um, work that we've published previously using genomics has, has found a, there's a lot of changes you can detect from using genomics by looking at read, um, uh, read depth analysis. And of course, um, landmark analysis from June Quan Chung's group demonstrating that aneuploidy of chromosome one will allow resistance to azole drugs um, to emerge. Um, we had also um, identified a case where you could get targeted duplication of genes that can confer drug resistance. Um, and this is an extreme example where um, in this case, you could get 13 time, th uh, thirteen um, X amplification just of the drug target in this one clinical isolate. So we went back and looked at um, first just at the active clinical isolates that I described um, for ones that display aneuploidy. And I want to focus on first the ones um, in these plots in dark blue that have an entire chromosome that's aneuploid. Um, so in the phylogeny, they're noted with the dark blue circles around the tree. So they're of diverse origin. Um, in the, the chromosome plot, they are, um, they're most commonly chromosome 12 and nine, but they are multiple chromosomes. The light blue is, is partial chromosome aneuploides, which can be of more different chromosomes. And then on the rightmost part of the slide demonstrates growth data um, that's showing that the aneuploids grow more slowly. So this is doubling time in both at 30 and 37. Um, there's a significantly slower growth that you observe for the aneuploid cells. Um, there has also been work from Neil Stone and Tahana Bikonik demonstrating that in a, um, a series of isolates from the same patient that um, kind of echoing what, what the Quan Chung lab has shown that you can pick up um, an extra copy of chromosome one, but this is, um, this is unstable and, and, and um, uh, is confers hetero resistance to azole drugs over the course of recurrent infections. Um, we do not see that there is very much um, chromosome one aneuploidy in, in these ACTA isolates, but most of them were taken at the beginning of the trial. Um, so the, the patients have not yet undergone their full azole therapy yet. So that might not be surprising. Um, so most of the isolates um, were capable of growth on fluconazole. Only one had this chromosome one aneuploidy. Um, and uh, there's some others that were um, not aneuploid that could that could grow on on fluconazole. But what we see much bigger picture is um, in larger cohorts is just a huge bias for, clinical isolates to be aneuploid compared to environmental isolates. So here looking at VNB um, as a whole, this, this group of 650 isolates that we've sequenced, we see that 13% of isolates 
that are clinical are aneuploid compared to 3% of environmental. Um, and again, we see this kind of the same signal of maybe chromosome 4 and 12 being the most frequent clinically. Environmental, it looks like um, also chromosome 4 being is, is very common, but, but it's much smaller numbers. And we also looked back at a larger set of VN1 isolates, um, looking back not just our, at our data, but other published data, so 1,400 isolates. And here also we see a very big difference, 12% of clinical um, compared to only 3% of environmental. Um, again, chromosome 12 comes up as very frequent, but now uh, different um, other chromosomes. And I just wanted to highlight um, one other piece of data, which is that, I mean, cryptococcus will, uh, will tolerate all other kinds of, of unusual karyotype behavior in that it can form hybrids with its related sister species, Deneoformans. And when it does so, um, it it can it uh, it undergoes um, widespread aneuploidy and loss of heterozygosity. So this is the example of um, this is a single genome now of two different a hybrid of both A and D. Um, looking across um, the y-axis, both these genomes are in a single cell, but in some isolates, there's there are extra copies of one or the other chromosomes. And in the bottom one, one or the other um, chromosome might have been lost or gained. And yet, when we analyze these at a genetic level, all of these isolates that are shown at the top in terms of SNPs are nearly identical. So, um, and if you look at a finer scale at some of these AD hybrids, this is one that um, has an example of one that has resolved itself to a close to haploid level, um, but has undergone crossing over between these A and D haplotypes. So to wrap up this, um, just this part of the some of these unusual features, I just wanted to highlight the level of genome instability that cryptococcus can undergo um, that appears very higher, much higher in clinical isolates um, and question if it could be due to stress or provide some kind of advantage to which we, we don't yet know the answer. Um, and while we know there's an advantage to chromosome one because of the role in drug resistance, it does seem that other chromosomes are more frequent and whether or not that's just because they're tolerated or if they might provide an advantage, I think is yet to be understood. We know that in Canada, there are particular triploides that provide an advantage for living in certain niches. So it, it seems possible there could be those things to find in cryptococcus. Um, and then I think it's an open question of, of how, um, when it's, how can cryptococcus can tolerate this level of aneuploidy um, when it's clearly such a growth disadvantage, for example. And then to wrap up the, the genome-wide scans that I talked to you about, um, we've begun to show that um, clinical isolates can be used to find um, variation linked to melanization um, and clinical origin. And I didn't show data on drug resistance, but it's in some of our papers. And the direction we're moving for this work is to increase our power. We're, we're definitely underpowered for the types of variants we're trying to find. Um, and we also would really like to just measure virulence directly by pooling isolates um, to be able to kind of side by side um, be able to associate on virulence. So we're we're sequencing additional isolates and, and working on those additional phenotypes. So in some of the time that remains, I wanted to talk about um, newer work that's ongoing that I thought might be of interest to a genomic audience. And it's um, a comparative genomic project, um, stepping back, thinking about um, how cryptococcus has evolved and, and kind of an unusual finding that came out of that. Um, so again, I kind of, I started out some of the talk um, talking about how cryptococcus is 
um, not very closely related to other pathogens. But now I'm I'm going to kind of zoom in around it um, and uh, look at what's kind of immediately outside of it. And it's within this group of um, species listed here. Um, the Cryptococcus neoformans and gadii are related to these other species, um, some other Cryptococcus and some other Quaniella. Some of the names have, have changed, I'll show on the next slide, um, that are mostly saprobic taxa that have been isolated from um, different types of um, arthropods, from um, other types of plants. There's some that are mycoparasites or soil. Um, and so we, working with Joe Heitman's group at Duke, um, thought that if we sequence these species related to Cryptococcus, that might give us a view into how the human pathogens differ um, if we could just zoom into their genomes. So we initially had um, started this with Illumina sequencing, but um, we have since moved to um, completing all of these genomes with long read sequencing um, and have now this kind of complete view of um, this Cryptococcus clade at the top and the sister um, genus Quaniella at the bottom. And the top group in red encompasses the, the pathogens. Um, and then there's several Cryptococcus below it that are not pathogenic. And then all of the Quaniella are just related um, saprobic species. So one way the pathogens differ is that their genomes are a little bit smaller. That's the next, that's the first column. Um, they're about 18 up to 19 meg. The, the genomes of the other species are a little bit bigger. Um, uh, and, and so they have slightly fewer genes as well, but um, in evaluation of the um, conserved gene content, all of these look pretty complete in terms of our efforts at predicting genes. So we looked at gene conservation by um, building orthologs across all of these species and looking at conservation patterns. And this is work um, um, from Marco Coelho at Duke and Sage McGinley-Smith, who is an uh, uh, undergrad in my group. And we looked initially at um, patterns of, to see what was the predominant patterns, but then have, have focused in um, initially on the groups that were um, unique to some of the pathogens, such as this group, um, the, those just found in the pathogenic species. And what's striking, um, just for starters, is how few there are of them. There's only 53 um, orthologs, and they include some genes that are um, of potentially interesting function, like hustle hydrolase, some transcription factors, oxidative reductase, a whole lot of genes of unknown function. But what they do not include is all of the many of the and all of the canonical virulence factor pathways, um, which are the which are found in all of these species. So when you think about all of the genes required to produce capsule or melanin, which we think about as cryptococcus virulence factors, those are found in all species. What we um, focused on next. Um, that was the surprise that came out of this project had to do with karyotype um, when we got to the point of complete genomes. And that while most of these, many of these um, genomes and all of the pathogens had 14 chromosomes, chromosome number varied from three chromosomes to 14. Um, and that you could um, infer um, based on some of the ones with 14 in two of these species, that it appears that um, we would estimate the ancestral chromosomes were, were that there were 14 chromosomes, that we could align, um, we could paint over the, the 14 chromosomes between these two species, um, between these two groups, and they look fairly syntenic. But if we look now across the Quaniella, where the chromosome number varies so widely, 
Um, and we start painting from um, one of the ones that has 14 now across the other species. Um, you can, what I hope you can appreciate is that there's been a really unusual pattern of chromosome fusion that has occurred in these species. Um, and in particular, with these, the species that have three or five or six chromosomes, um, there's mainly been one chromosome that's been the object of all the chromosome fusion. And this is just a little more detail on what has taken place. Um, so starting from the, the two species in the top two rows um, that have multiple chromosomes, um, what has occurred is a series of, um, of fusions where there's been an inversion um, that is, has occurred next to the centromere, um, which is then um, lost, the centromere is lost in then the, um, the fusion chromosome that is then present at the bottom. Um, so this is not, I'll show a, a model on the, the next slide. Um, but in the, in the process of, of all of these fusions, it's not just simply chromosomes joining together. Um, it's a series of, of, of inversions linked to um, centromeres. So all of this, this then um, um, process probably inactivated all of the centromeres. So you end up just with the one centromere um, that is the ancestral one. Um, one other thing that we we have um, uh, followed up on is that the centromere length is is pretty different in all of these species. We can predict this computationally by looking at this class of um, transposons. They are. I'm just showing an example on the right hand slide of what centromeres look like in Cryptococcus neoformans. It's not exactly the same. It's not the same elements in all species, but we can identify similar elements at all of the centromeres um, in these species. And further, um, uh, Marcia Parra in the Heitman lab has, has proven these are centromeres using um, chromatin um, uh, IP methods. Um, but what is striking is that the, the centromere size has changed in these species, but it's, it's not that the, the species with um, three chromosomes have the, the the tiniest centromeres, but definitely the Quaniella as a group have very small centromeres compared to the Cryptococcus. So we're this is a bit of a whiteboard slide to end this part of the talk. We're trying to think about how this has occurred because um, we need to join things together while uh, making inversions and inactivating centromeres. Um, so this could occur by fusing centromeres and by fusing telomeres um, and then in, and then uh, inverting or the other way around. I think um, some things to um, add layers into the, the ideas we think about is that we, we don't see any loss of telomeric genes. So there, there haven't been um, telomeres getting chewed away that are kind of instigating the process. Um, and neither really do we see kind of centromere um, genes kind of adjacent to centromeres being lost. So it's, it's, it's really a, um, a, a fine scale process that kind of initiates this um, kind of fusion events and um, definitely unusual that they're all being joined to a single chromosome. So just to wrap this part of the talk, and this is the end of, this will be the end is that, um, we are thinking about kind of the evolution of Cryptococcus as um, uh, thinking about, um, you know, that a lot of the canonical virulence traits for how, um, what we think about as path a pathogen are already present in a lot of the saprobes. Um, a lot of the capacity to be a pathogen, if we just think about gene content, might already be there. And that we have to understand specialization at a finer scale to think about how the pathogens have um, adapted to become pathogens. And that the, the last story is what I just talked about is, is thinking about um, karyotype evolution and how this unusual mechanism occurred. 
So I wanted to acknowledge a large number of people um, who contributed to the work I talked about. Um, in particular, I'll call out um, Poppy Septon Clark, who did a lot of the Cryptococcus population genomics, and Sage, who's worked on this um, comparative project um, in my group. Um, at Duke, we worked very closely both with John Perfect and Joe Heitman's group, and um, Jenny and Marco and Marcia in their labs. And then the um, ACTA clinical trial was a close collaboration with Tahana Bakanek and Tom Harrison's groups. And I would be happy to pause here and take any questions. Well, thank you, Christina. And um, people can go to the microphones in the aisles and also um, post questions online and we will be monitoring those. And um, I see people already going to the mics, but I'm going to ask a question anyway. I've got a couple. Um, but uh, so I'll start with one about the, the transmissions and, and your thoughts that they are coming from the environment into patients. And I wonder, I mean, that was originally the model with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and cystic fibrosis kids. And then it was shown that on top of that, there actually was a fair amount of transmission occurring in the hospitals. Um, and so I guess I wonder if there are any um, strains like that have um, that you're seeing repeatedly that maybe would suggest that there is some patient to patient transmission within the facilities and some strains that maybe have optimized a fitness landscape for colonizing human hosts. We are working with a data set now that, so the, the, the data that we worked with for the ACTA trial was from these um, just three hospitals from Malawi, but we are working now with a data set that's from a fourth location. And in that data set, we definitely have strains that look like they are suspiciously very closely related. And so we have a call next week to talk to the people about yeah. this because yes, it does look suspicious that it could be, you would, you would think it could be transmission, but I wouldn't, um, we haven't seen anything like this before, but yes, it it yeah. does look suspicious. I think that there, you know, we we kind of went down this road when there was um, in the news, a few you know, pre-pandemic, a few years before the pandemic, there was a supposed cryptococcus outbreak in this hospital in the UK where they thought they had contamination in like a a garden inside the hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we worked with Andy Borman and a couple other people there and sequenced the isolates from patients and isolates they collected from, they tried to collect isolates from the garden and they didn't even get any cryptococcus. And so they just collect that, they collected a couple other isolates from nearby. The big, the long story short, nothing was related in that case. So, a lot of these cases, there's just a lot of diversity. We do have this one case of this fourth, this other site in Africa where it looks like there could be some genetic relationships. Hi, great, great talk. Um, so uh, the, the aneuploidy sort of lower fitness yet um, more common in the, the isolates sort of locked in a, a question. I was, have you ever tried competing a virulent and non-virulent in a in an immunocompromised mouse or rabbit because i'm wondering if if it's not just colonize get better at colonizing people but the the immunocompromised environment is a specific niche and it these these mutations are only useful in that context and actually reduce uh vigor in even a wild type or, or a normal immuno, immuno normal person, I guess. That's definitely a, a direction we want to go in that we are um, putting barcodes into strains so we can start competing them. Um, and I, we had uh, in some of our work, not on cryptococcus, but on Canada, we had seen some nice differences in strains in the the gut but versus the blood um 
that yeah, maybe we would start to see things in in certain types of patients. I mean, we don't, I don't think for, yeah, we haven't worked in a, um, I'll have to think of, I'll, I'll have to uh, talk to John Perfect about if there's a good, uh, how we're how we're accounting for the immunocompromised part in the animals. Yeah, that's not. Um, I was wondering about this uh, uh, massive fusion event that you're seeing across chromosomes. Yeah. Could that somehow be caused by some sort of spore competition um, in meiosis where the larger chromosome, spores inheriting larger chromosomes are somehow getting an advantage over the other spores or if there might be like a selfish element, like a spore killer gene that somehow uh, all the chromosomes want to be on that, on the chromosome that has the spore killer gene or something like that? It's an interesting idea. We would take any ideas like that because we've been trying to, we've, we've, I think we've been stuck figuring like why it seems like it would just be more of a disadvantage to be dragging around that big chromosome during mitosis. So yes, thank you for the idea. I had an idea and then we'll go to the online. And, or I had a question, sorry, I didn't have an idea. Um, do you think that these could be used as a model for chromosome fusion or karyotype evolution? I mean, you've got it now, but are you seeing this happening or could you use these, uh, these you know, um, species to try to force karyotype evolution and, and learn more about the process? So, um, well, Joe has done an experiment where he has used CRISPR to induce a break and then sees what happens in neoformans. So I guess you could think about doing those types of yeah. things, right? If your hypothesis is something was initiated by a break. Um, there is, it seems that in um, neoformans that um, centromeric, centromeres are also favored sites of rearrangements. So I think that's just part of the story is that that's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's because of proximity, if, if centromere clustering is part of what's going on and that's um, initiating some, you've, you've just starting initiating rearrangements and then something goes awry. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Andrew Hazley or Hasley. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Um, he asks, could there be an underlying relationship between the aneuploidy tolerance and the unique karyotypic evolution in the environmental strains? Tie between aneuploidy tolerance and the unique karyotypic evolution in the environmental strains? Well, there seems to be less aneuploidy in the environmental strains. Um, I think that, I mean, we've always more worried about like, when are we just losing aneuploidy when we're culturing things because is obviously um, uh, since it's uh, um, since it's a growth disadvantage, we've all we've 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 had some concerns. We're biased just by um, uh, just by by culturing. We might be losing things, um, but yeah, it it seems to be more of a factor in clinical strains. I think that the, yeah, this, the, we haven't, I haven't seen as much of, uh, I think I'm beginning to come convinced that there's a, the, both the frequency is higher in clinical strains and that there, there's a specific chromosome. The biggest signal is chromosome 12 um, in clinical strains. Um, okay, and then I actually had a question, which was, um, did you look at the bird poop isolate separately from the environmental isolates? I mean, I wonder whether passage through a host actually, I mean, we know for candidate albicans that passage through a mammalian host increases the mutation rate. And I wonder if it's something specific about the mammalian environment or... 
I, so they tend to be more of the VN1 isolates um, that are that are more of the VN1 isolates um, that came from birds as well as VN2. Um, we did also we had this this um, the one case that's been linked to the environment came from a bird. It's it came from a cockatoo. Someone had a pet cockatoo and they got cryptococcus from their cockatoo. Um, but there wasn't a series of isolates, unfortunately, from the cockatoo. It was just a single isolate. Um, great, we've got our last question. Well, great, Dr. Krishna. Um, quick question about the selective sweep in your in your slide. So, do you have in your isolate are they all haplotype or do you have de uh, diploid also? My question is: Do you have a selective swipe or could you have also clonal interference in your data set? There are some diploid cryptococcus that we 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 did look at that. Um, separately in the genetics paper that we published, but there, I didn't talk about any of those here. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Christina, for a wonderful talk and for visiting us at NIH.